Chapter 7 Boy and Girl Love Paul went to Willie Farm many times during the autumn. He made friends with the two younger Lever boys. Edgar kept his distance at first, and Miriam also did not let him approach her. She was deeply romantic by nature. Literature was important to her, and religion. She did not care much about being beautiful, and in general, she did not think highly of the male sex. But she saw in Paul a new type of male, quick and light, one who could be gentle and sad, who knew a lot, and who had had a death in the family. Gradually, he began to spend more time with Miriam. They had a common feeling for things in nature, flowers, trees and birds. She and her mother admired his paintings and encouraged him. One dull afternoon, when the others were out, the girl said to him, hesitating, Have you seen the swing? No, he answered. Where? Come, she said. I'll show you. In the cowhouse, a great thick rope with a seat on the end hung from the roof. Paul sat down, eager to try it, then immediately rose. Come on then, and have first go, he said to her. No, I won't go first, she answered. You go. All right, he said, sitting down again. Watch this. In a moment, he was flying through the air, every bit of him swinging, diving like a bird in the pleasure of movement. He looked down at her. Her red woolen hat hung over her dark curls, and her beautiful warm face was lifted towards him. He gradually swung more slowly and jumped off. This swing's a real winner, he cried delightedly. Miriam was amused that he took the swing so seriously. Don't you want to try it? asked Paul. Well, not much. I'll have just a little one. He held the seat steady for her, then started her moving. Keep your feet up, or you'll hit the wall. She felt him catch her and push her again, and was afraid. Again came his push, at just the right moment. Huh? <gasps> she laughed in fear. No higher! But you're not a bit high, he complained. But no higher! He heard the fear in her voice and stopped pushing. She felt sure he was going to push her again. But no, he left her alone. She swung more slowly and got down. Paul took her place and away he went. For a time, he was nothing but a body swinging in space. There was no part of him that did not swing. She could never lose herself like that. Later on, they talked. She was very dissatisfied with her life. Just because I'm a girl, why must I stay at home? Why am I not allowed to do anything? What chance do I have? Chance of what? Of knowing anything. Of learning. Of doing anything. It's not fair. Just because I'm a woman. But it's as good to be a woman as a man, said Paul. Huh, is it? Men have everything. But what do you want? He asked. I want to learn. Why must I know nothing? You mean mathematics and French? Yes. Why can't I learn mathematics? She cried, her eyes widening. Next time he went up to the farm, he found Miriam cleaning the kitchen. Ready to do some mathematics? He asked, taking a little book from his pocket. But he could see she was doubtful. You said you wanted to, he insisted. Yes, but tonight I, I wasn't expecting it. However, 
they made a start. Paul taught Miriam regularly. She had always studied the work from the week before, but things came slowly to her. He got angry with her, felt ashamed, continued the lesson, got angry again. She listened in silence. She rarely protested. You don't give me time to learn it. She was right. It was strange that no one else made him so angry. When he saw her suffering, again he felt pity. His painting was improving. Mr. Jordan had given him Wednesday afternoon off to go to the art school. He loved to sit at home alone with his mother at night, working and working. But when a drawing was finished, he always wanted to take it to Miriam. The Bestwood Library was open on Thursday evenings. Paul and Miriam were in the habit of meeting there when they changed their library books. Afterwards, Paul often went part of the way home with her. Always, when he went with Miriam, and it got rather late, he knew his mother was worrying and getting angry with him. She did not like Miriam. She felt that the girl was leading Paul away from her. She will never let him become a man. She never will, she thought. So when he was away with Miriam, Mrs. Morell got more and more annoyed. What are you so displeased about? he asked. Is it because you don't like her? I don't say I don't like her. But I don't agree with young boys and girls staying out late, and never did. He kissed her and went slowly to bed. He had forgotten Miriam. He saw only that his mother was somehow hurt. Sometimes, as they were walking together, Miriam put her arm shyly into his. But he always disliked it, and she knew this. He himself did not know what was the matter. He was so young, and their relationship was so unphysical. He did not know that he really wanted to press her to his breast, to reduce the ache there. He was too ashamed to recognize the fact that he might want her as a man wants a woman. Neither of them could face such an idea, and the purity of their feelings prevented even their first love kiss. It was as if she could scarcely accept the shock of physical love, while he was too shy and sensitive to give it. Chapter 8 The Battle of Love Out of kindness to his mother, Paul did not go much to Willie Farm for a while. He sent two pictures to the autumn exhibition of students' work at the Castle Museum, and both of them won first prizes. He was most excited, and his mother was enormously pleased. William had won sports prizes, which she still kept. She did not forgive his death. Arthur, now in the army, was handsome, warm and generous. He would probably do well in the end. But Paul was going to do something important in life. She believed in him more firmly because he himself did not seem to realize his own capabilities. Life for her was rich with promise. Her struggle had not been for nothing. Several times during the exhibition, Mrs. Morell went to the castle museum, unknown to Paul. She wandered round the long room, looking at the other pictures. Some made her jealous they were so good. Then suddenly, she had a shock that made her heart beat. There hung Paul's picture. Name, Paul Morell. First prize. She felt a proud woman. When she passed well-dressed ladies going home through the park, she thought to herself, Yes, you look very fine, but I wonder if your son has two first prizes in the exhibition. One day, Paul met Miriam in the street in Nottingham. He had not expected to meet her in town. She was walking with a rather impressive young woman, fair-haired, with a discontented expression, who held herself boldly upright. It was strange how small Miriam looked beside this woman with the handsome shoulders. 
Miriam watched Paul closely. His eyes were on the stranger, not on her. She explained that she had driven into market with her father. I've told you about Mrs. Dawes, she said nervously. Clara, do you know Paul? I think I've seen him before, replied Mrs. Dawes, showing little interest as she shook hands. She had proud grey eyes, a skin like white honey, and a full mouth, with a slightly lifted top lip. Her clothes were simple and rather dull. Clearly she was poor, and unlike Miriam, did not have much taste. Where have you seen me? asked Paul. Walking with Louis Travers, she replied. Louis was one of the girls in the factory. How do you know her? he asked. She did not answer. The two women moved on towards the castle. Paul remembered that Clara was the daughter of an old friend of Mrs. Leaver's. She had once held one of the better jobs at Jordan's, and her husband, Baxter Dawes, still worked there, making metal parts. But Mrs. Dawes was separated from her husband and had taken up the cause of women. People said she was clever. He knew Baxter Dawes from work, a big, well-built man of 31 or two. He had the same white skin as his wife and a golden moustache, but his eyes moved continually this way and that. He seemed to have little self-respect. Usually, he was rude and insulting. He and Paul met often enough in the factory and disliked each other. Clara Dawes had no children. She now lived with her mother. The next time Miriam saw him, she asked, What did you think of Clara Dawes? She has a good figure, answered Paul, but she doesn't look very friendly. Is she unpleasant as a person? I don't think so. I think she's discontented, still married to a man like Baxter. What other things did you like about her? Oh, I don't know. Her passionate mouth, the shape of her throat, her skin. There's something fierce about her. I think I'd like to do a painting of her. Miriam seemed strangely lost in thought. You don't really like her, do you? He asked her. Oh, yes, I do she said. Perhaps you like her because she's so much against men. Paul was now 21. Mr. Jordan had put him in charge of the department where he worked and had increased his wages to 30 shillings a week. At the art school, he was studying design. He was also helping Miriam to learn French. On Friday evenings, when his father went to the pub and his mother to the market, Paul was left at home to watch the baking of the bread. Annie, who was now engaged to be married to Leonard, her young man, was also out visiting. At a quarter past seven, there was a low knock and Miriam came in. He showed her his latest artwork and corrected the French she had written for him. This week, she had done well. He loved to talk about his work with Miriam. All his passion went into these conversations. Somehow, she lit up his imagination. Aren't you forgetting the bread? Miriam said suddenly. Paul rushed to open the oven door. Out came bluish smoke. One loaf was hard as a brick. Another was burned black along one side. Paul tried to scratch off the burnt part, then wrapped it in a wet towel and left it in the back kitchen. They went back to their French until it was time for Miriam to go home. Paul turned down the gas and they set off. He did not get home again until a quarter to 11. His mother was in her chair reading the local newspaper. Annie was sitting in front of the fire, looking gloomy. The burnt loaf, unwrapped, stood on the table. Paul felt very uncomfortable. For some minutes, he sat, pretending to read. Then, I forgot that bread, mother. 
There was no answer from either woman. You don't know how ill our mother is, said Annie after a pause. Why, is she so ill? asked Paul sharply. She could hardly get home. I found her white as anything sitting here, said Annie in a tearful voice. I had so many parcels, said Mrs. Morell. The meat and the vegetables and a pair of curtains. Let Annie fetch the meat, said Paul. But how was I to know? You were off with Miriam instead of being here when Mother came. And what's the matter with you? Paul asked his mother. I suppose it's my heart, she replied. She certainly looked bluish round the mouth. And have you felt it before? Yes, often enough. Then why haven't you told me? And why haven't you seen a doctor? You'd never notice anything, said Annie. You're too eager to be off with Miriam. So that was why the bread was spoiled, said Mrs. Morell bitterly. No, it was not, he replied angrily. I bought you a nice piece of cheese, said his mother. He was too angry to go and look for it. I don't want anything, he said. If I want you to go out on a Friday night, you say you're too tired, she complained. But you're never too tired to go if she comes for you. I can't let her go back alone, can't you? Then why does she come? Because you want her. I do like to talk to her, but I don't love her, Paul explained. We talk about painting and books. You know you don't care whether a picture is decorative or not. How do you know I don't care? Oh, you're old, mother, and we're young. He only meant that the interests of her age group were not the interests of his. But the moment he had spoken, he realised that he had said the wrong thing. It was too painful. He realised that he was life to her. And after all, she was the chief thing to him, the only all-important thing. No, mother, I really don't love her. I talk to her, but I want to come home to you. As he bent to kiss his mother, she threw her arms round his neck and cried in a desperate voice quite unlike her own. It's too much. I could let another woman, but not her. And I've never... You know, Paul, I've never had a husband. Not really. Immediately, he hated Miriam bitterly. His mother kissed him, a kiss of passionate love. Without knowing, he gently stroked her face. At that moment, Morel came in, walking unsteadily, his hat over one eye. He paused in the doorway. Make him more trouble, he said with an ugly look. Mrs. Morel's feelings turned to sudden hatred of her drunken husband. At least I'm not drunk, she said. Morel disappeared and returned with a piece of cheese in his hand. It was what Mrs. Morell had bought for Paul. And I didn't buy that for you. If you give me only 25 shillings, don't expect me to buy you cheese when you're already full up with beer. What? shouted Morell. What? Not for me. He looked at the cheese in his hand and suddenly threw it into the fire. Paul jumped to his feet. Waste your own food, he cried. What? What? shouted Morell, taking up a threatening position. I'll show you, you cheeky young fool. All right, said Paul hotly. Show me. At that moment, he wanted to hit his father violently. There, cried Morell delivering a great blow just past his son's face. Even so close, he did not dare to touch the younger man. Right, said Paul, and was preparing to hit his father on the mouth. He ached to land the blow. 
but he heard a frightened sound behind him. His mother was pale as death and dark around the lips. Morel was dancing up to deliver another blow. Father, said Paul urgently. Morel shook and stood still. Mother, cried the boy. Mother! She began to struggle with herself. She could not move. Gradually, she got more control. Paul laid her down on the sofa and ran to fetch her something to drink. The tears were streaming down his face. What's the matter with her? said Morel, sitting on the opposite side of the room. She's fainted, replied Paul. Morel took his boots off and went unsteadily to his bed. Paul knelt there, stroking his mother's hand. It's nothing, my boy, she whispered. Paul made up the fire, straightened the room, laid the things for breakfast, and brought his mother's candle. He followed her up the stairs and kissed her once more. Good night, mother. Good night, she said. In the days that followed, everyone tried to forget what had taken place. Chapter 9 The Defeat of Miriam The Easter holiday began happily. Paul rode his bicycle up to Willie Farm, but he was in a hard, critical mood when he went out walking round the farm with Miriam. Paul kept on finding fault with her, they stopped to rest on a bed of dry grass. Why are you sad? She asked gently. I'm not sad. Why should I be? He answered. I'm only normal. She wondered why he always called himself normal when he was unpleasant. But what's the matter? She insisted. Nothing. He picked up a stick and dug the earth with it in a fever of bad temper. Gently, but firmly, she put her hand on his. Don't, she said. Put it away. He threw the stick into the grass and leaned back. What is it? She asked again softly. He lay quite still with only his eyes alive and those full of unhappiness. You know, he said finally, his voice rather tired. You know, we'd better break off. Why? she asked. What has happened? Nothing has happened. I can only give friendship. I'm not capable of anything more. It's not equal, our relationship. Let's end it. He meant that she loved him more than he loved her. She pitied him in his suffering. He felt so ashamed. But I don't understand, she said. I know, he cried. You never will. You'll never believe I can't. Can't physically... Any more than I can fly. Can't what? She whispered. Love you. What have they been saying at home? She asked. It's not that he answered. But she knew it was. They did not talk much more that evening. Instead, Paul and Edgar went off on their bicycles. He had come back to his mother. Hers was the strongest tie in his life. Even Miriam seemed unreal when he thought about her. And in the same way his mother depended on him, Paul was going to change the face of the earth in some way that really mattered. And yet, for Paul, it was not enough. His new young life, so strong and commanding, was driving him on towards something else. It made him mad with restlessness. Miriam had not stopped hoping to win Paul back. He still visited the Leavers, but spent most of his time with Edgar. In May, she asked Paul to come to the farm and meet Mrs. Dawes. He was rather excited at the idea of seeing Clara again. 
Mrs. Dawes came for the day. Her heavy, fair hair was twisted on top of her head. She wore a white blouse and a dark blue skirt. Miriam saw him look round eagerly at the house. Hasn't Clara come yet? he asked. Yes, replied Miriam in her musical voice. She came this morning. She's reading. And is she any pleasanter? he asked again. You know, I always think she's quite pleasant. Clara sat inside reading. Paul saw the back of her white neck with the fine hair lifted up from it. She rose, looking at him without interest. When she shook hands, she seemed to keep him at a distance and yet offer him something. He noticed the roundness of her breasts inside her blouse and the fine curve of her shoulders. You've chosen a fine day, he said. It seems so, she answered. The conversation continued for a little. Clara did not seem to find Paul's comments at all clever. Well, I think I'll go and see Edgar, he said, and left them. After tea, Mrs. Leavers said to Clara, And you find life happier now? Much happier. And are you satisfied? If I can remain free and independent, yes. And you don't miss anything in your life? Asked Mrs. Leavers gently. I've put all that behind me. Paul had been listening to this conversation. You'll find you're always falling over the things you've put behind you, he said, and left to find Edgar again. He felt he had been clever and was proud of himself. He whistled as he went. A little later, Miriam came to ask if he would go with her and Clara for a walk. Clara walked in front by herself for part of the way, her head bent. Paul was curious about her. He forgot Miriam, who was walking beside him, talking to him. She looked at him, finding he did not answer her. His eyes were fixed in front on Clara. Do you still think she is unpleasant? She asked. Something's the matter with her, he said. Yes, said Miriam. They came to a field hidden by trees round the edges. In the smooth grass, beautiful, bright yellow spring flowers were growing. Paul and Miriam started picking them. Clara wandered about, looking depressed. Then she knelt down, bending forward to smell the flowers. Her neck looked such a beautiful thing. Her breasts swung slightly in her blouse. The curve of her back was beautiful and strong. Suddenly, without realizing, Paul was dropping a handful of flowers over her hair and neck. She looked up at him with fear in her grey eyes, wondering what he was doing. Suddenly, standing there above her, he felt uncomfortable. Clara laughed strangely and rose, picking the flowers from her hair. One flower remained caught in her hair. Paul saw, but did not tell her. He collected the flowers he had dropped. Unexpectedly, she gave him a grateful smile. Going down the path, they were all silent. As the evening deepened, they could see the mining village across the valley. Little lights on a dark hill touching the sky. It's been nice, hasn't it? said Paul. Miriam agreed. Clara was silent. He could tell by the way she moved, pretending not to care, that she suffered. At home, he told his mother about Clara, that she was poor, that she lived with her mother, that she was thirty years old. And what's so charming about her, my boy? asked his mother. I don't know that she's charming, mother, but she's nice. She seems straight, you know, not a bit deep. Mrs. Morell was not against the idea of Clara. Annie and Leonard were getting married. 
she had saved 11 pounds and Leonard 23, so the wedding took place almost immediately. Arthur came home and looked sensational in his army uniform. Annie looked nice in a grey dress she could also use for Sundays. Morel was cool to Leonard. Annie cried her eyes out in the kitchen on leaving her mother. Mrs. Morel cried a little, then stroked her and said, Don't cry, child. It'll be good to you. Afterwards, Paul and Mrs. Morel were left alone. You're not sorry she's married, mother, are you? No. But it seems strange how she's gone from me. When I think of my own wedding day, I can only hope that her life will be different. I'll never marry while I've got you. I won't. He kissed her and went to bed. Mrs. Morell sat thinking about her daughter, about Paul, about Arthur. She was upset at losing Annie, but Paul needed her, and Arthur needed her too. Paul felt life changing around him. Annie was married. Arthur was living his own life of pleasure. For both of them, life lay outside their mother's house. They only came home for holidays and rest. Paul dreamed of following them. Yet home for him was beside his mother. He grew more and more restless. Miriam did not satisfy him. His old wish to be with her grew weaker. Sometimes he met Clara in Nottingham. Sometimes he saw her at Willie Farm. But between Paul and Clara and Miriam, there was always a kind of struggle. For Miriam's 21st birthday, Paul wrote her a long, rather philosophical letter, which more or less brought their relationship to an end. He was now 23 years old, and his sexual need was growing strong. Often, when he talked to Clara Dawes, he was conscious of his blood flowing quicker, of something alive in him, of a new self, a new consciousness. He knew that sooner or later, his need would have to be satisfied. Chapter 10 Clara When he was 23, Paul sent in a painting to the winter exhibition at the Castle Museum. One morning, the postman came when Mrs. Morell was doing the washing. Suddenly, Paul heard a wild noise from his mother. Rushing into the kitchen, he found her screaming and waving a letter, as if she had gone mad. The postman too came running back, afraid something bad had happened. His picture's got first prize, Fred, she cried. And it's been sold for 20 pounds. That looks like meaning something, said the young postman. Didn't I say we would do it, she said, pretending she was not crying. Morel was greatly impressed. 20 pounds for a bit of a painting that took him just an hour or two, he said, amazed. Yes, and that other boy would have done as much if they hadn't killed him, he added quietly. The thought of William went through Mrs. Morell like a sharp knife. Arthur left the army and immediately got married to Beatrice, whom he had known for years. The baby was born six months after the wedding. With the help of Beatrice's mother, Mrs. Morell found furniture for a little two-room house. He was caught now. For a while, he refused to settle down and got annoyed with his young wife, who loved him. He nearly went mad when the baby cried or gave trouble. He complained for hours to his mother, who only said, Well, my son, you did it yourself. Now you must make the best of it. And then the stronger side of his character appeared. He accepted his responsibilities, recognized that he belonged to his wife and child, and made a good job of it. The months passed slowly. 
One day, a friend of Clara's in Bestwood asked Paul to take a message to Mrs. Dawes. In the evening after work, he went to the house where she lived with her mother. The street was poor, and the paint on the front door was old. A large, fat woman of about 60 answered his knock. This was Mrs. Radford, Clara's mother. In a moment, Clara appeared. Her face went red. She seemed embarrassed that he had discovered her at home like this. She invited him into the kitchen, where the two women spent all their time making lace. The room was full of the white, snowy stuff. Clara gave him a chair, brought him a beer, and went on with her work. Her arm moved mechanically as she used the machine. Her head was bent over the lace. Her life seemed so narrow, so limited, Paul thought. Her grey eyes at last met his. He recognised that she was deeply unhappy, a kind of prisoner. He felt shaken. It was not what he had expected. She had seemed so high and proud. He left in a kind of dream. The girl in charge of the stocking department at Jordan's was leaving to get married. He told Clara about the vacant position. So Clara came back to Jordan's. Now they were fellow workers and saw each other several times a day. When Paul was painting in the afternoon, she often came and stood near him, keeping perfectly still. Although she stood a yard away, he felt as if she was pressed against him, and he was full of her warmth. Then he could paint no more. He threw down the brushes and began to talk. On Paul's birthday, he met Clara by chance in the dinner hour. They decided to go together up to the castle. At the top, they leaned over the wall. Away at the foot of the rock, tiny trees stood in their own pools of shadow, and tiny people went rushing about with amusing self-importance. She disliked towns. Clara told him, When things are natural, they're beautiful. And what isn't natural? asked Paul. Everything man has made, she answered including man himself. But his women made him, he remarked. Wasn't Baxter Dawes natural? She changed colour and looked away from him. We will not discuss it, she said. Later that afternoon, the postman brought Paul a small packet. It was a book of poems with a note inside. Please allow me to send you this. I am sympathetic to your problems and wish you well. C.D. Paul felt deeply moved and warm towards her. After this, they often went out together in the dinner hour. Paul asked her about doors. How old were you when you married? Twenty-two. That was eight years ago. Yes. And when did you leave him? Three years ago. Five years together. Did you love him when you married him? I thought I did, more or less. I didn't think much about it. He wanted me. And why did you leave him finally? Because he was unfaithful to me. I believe he still loves you, said Paul. Probably, she replied. She was a married woman and believed in simple friendship. Paul considered that he was behaving quite correctly towards her. It was only a friendship between man and woman, such as any sensible people might have. It seemed to him quite plain. Miriam was his old friend and lover. She belonged to Bestwood and home and his growing up. Clara was a newer friend, and she belonged to Nottingham, to life to the world. Clara rarely saw Miriam now. They were still friends, but the friendship was much weakened. Will you come to the concert on Sunday? Clara asked Paul just after Christmas. I promised to go up to Willie Farm. 
he replied. You're not upset, are you? Why should I be? She answered. Again, Paul found himself telling her about Miriam. She wants me so much that I can't give myself. She wants the soul out of my body. And yet you love her? Asked Clara. No, I don't love her. I never even kiss her. Why not? Clara asked. I don't know. I suppose you're afraid. Anyway, she doesn't want to have your soul. That's your imagination. She wants you. He thought about this. Perhaps he was wrong. But she seems... He began. You've never tried. She answered. Chapter 11 The Test on Miriam With the spring, the old madness came back to Paul. He did not feel he wanted marriage with Miriam, and yet he wanted to belong to her. It was a powerful need, struggling with a still stronger shyness. He had a great tenderness for Miriam. He could not fail her. Mrs. Morell saw him going back to Miriam and was amazed. He said nothing to his mother. He did not explain or excuse himself. If he came home late and she made a comment, he answered coldly, I shall come home when I like. I'm old enough. And his mother went to bed, leaving the door unlocked for him. But she lay awake listening until he came, often long after. It was a great bitterness to her that he had gone back to Miriam. That summer, the cherry trees at the farm were heavy with fruit. They stood very tall, hung thick with bright red and dark red drops. Paul and Edgar were gathering the fruit one evening. It had been a hot day, and now the clouds were rolling in the sky, dark and warm. The wind made the whole tree swing with a thrilling movement that excited Paul. He sat unsteadily among the higher branches, feeling slightly drunk with the tree's movement, and tore off handful after handful of the smooth, cool fruit. Cherries touched his ears and neck as he leaned forward. Red-coloured fruit glowed under the darkness of the leaves. The sun going down caught the broken clouds. Enormous piles of gold shone out in the southeast. The world, until now grey, was bathed by the golden glow, making trees and grass and far-off water shine. Miriam came out to watch. Oh, Paul heard her call. Isn't it wonderful? He looked down. There was a pale light on the soft face turned up to him. How high you are, she said. He threw a handful of cherries at her. She was taken by surprise and was afraid. He laughed and rained more cherries down on her. She ran off to escape them, picking up some cherries on the way. She hung two fine pears over her ears then looked up again. Haven't you got enough? She asked. Nearly. It's like being on a ship up here. How long will you stay? Till the sunset ends. She watched the gold clouds turn to orange, then rose, then reddish purple, until the passion went out of the sky. Paul climbed down with his basket. They're lovely said Miriam, feeling the cherries. I've torn my sleeve, said Paul. It was near the shoulder. She put her fingers through the tear. How warm, she said. He laughed. There was a strange new sound in his voice. Shall we walk a little way, he said. They went down the fields as far as a thick wood. Shall we go in among the trees? He asked. Do you want to? 
Yes. It was very dark in the wood. She was afraid. Paul was silent and strange. He seemed hardly conscious of her as a person. To him, she was only a woman. He stood against a tree and took her in his arms. She gave herself to him, but as a victim, feeling some sort of horror. This thick-voiced man was a stranger to her. Later, it began to rain. Paul lay with his head on the ground, listening to the sharp sound of the raindrops. His heart was heavy. He realized that she had not been with him, that her soul had stood back. His body felt calmer, but that was all. She put her hands over him to feel if he was getting wet. We must go, said Miriam. Yes, said Paul, but did not move. The rain is coming in on us, said Miriam. He rose and helped her up. They walked hand in hand. In a while, they went indoors. They made love a number of times after this. Afterwards, Paul always had the feeling of failure and death. You don't really want me when I come to you, said Paul gloomily after a week or two. No, don't say so, she said, taking his head in her arms. Don't I want your children? Shall we get married then? said Paul. We're too young, she said after a pause. Not yet. With Paul, the sense of failure grew stronger. At first, it was only a sadness. Then he began to feel he could not go on. He wanted to run, go abroad, anything. Gradually, he stopped asking her to have him. He realized consciously that it was no good. He told his mother that he would break off with Miriam. On Sunday, he went up to the farm in the early afternoon. Miriam met him at the end of the farm road. She was wearing a new dress with short sleeves. She had made herself look so beautiful and fresh for him. They sat down. He lay with his head on her breast while she stroked his hair. She knew that he was somehow absent. I've been thinking, he said finally. We ought to break it off. What? She cried in surprise. Because it's no good going on. I want us to break off. You to be free of me. I free of you. How many times have you offered to marry me and I wasn't willing? I know. But I want us to break off. You're a child of four, she said in her anger. And what can I tell my mother? She asked. I told my mother that I was breaking it off. Cleanly and completely, he said. I shan't tell them at home, she said. It's always been the same. One long battle between us. You fighting me off. Not always. Not at first, he argued. Always, from the very beginning. Always the same. He sat in silence. His heart was hard against her. He left her at the road end. As she went home alone, in her new dress, having to face her family at the other end, he stood without moving on the high road, filled with pain and shame. Chapter 12 Passion After leaving Miriam, Paul turned almost immediately to Clara. One evening, they went to the cinema, and he took her hand in his. She neither moved nor made any sign. On Saturday evening, he invited her to have coffee with him after work. Afterwards, they walked for a little in the park, and in the darkness, he caught her suddenly in his arms and kissed her. For the whole of the next day, he only thought of seeing her again. 
Monday was his half day at work. He asked her if she would come out with him. They agreed to meet at half past two. In the bus, she leaned against him, and he took her hand. They got out beside the river and crossed the bridge. They walked along the path above the river and came to a locked gate. Paul climbed over first, then Clara climbed up onto it, and he held both her hands. Laughing, she looked down into his face. Then she jumped. Her breast came against his. He held her and covered her face with kisses. They decided to go down to the river's edge below. Slipping and sliding, they made their way to the bottom of the steep, wooded bank. Paul found a flat place at the foot of two trees. It was covered with wet leaves, but it would do. He threw down his raincoat and waved to her to come. She sank down at his side. He pressed his lips to her throat and felt the beat of her blood under his lips. Everything was perfectly still. There was nothing in the afternoon but themselves. They had a steep climb to get back to the public path at the top. Then they walked into Clifton and had tea at a guest house. He was madly in love with her now. Every movement she made, every fold in her clothes sent a thrill through him. Mrs. Morell was sitting reading when he got home. You're late, she said, looking at him. His eyes were shining. His face seemed to glow. Yes, I've been down at Clifton Grove with Clara. She's... she's awfully nice, Mother. Would you like to know her? Yes, said Mrs. Morell coolly. I should like to know what she's like. You don't expect to like her, said Paul. I'll bring her here on Sunday for tea. Shall I bring her? You please yourself said Mrs. Morell, laughing. Paul knew that he had won. He mentioned to Miriam that Clara was coming to tea on Sunday. I want my mother to meet her, he added. Ah. There was a silence. I may call in before I go to the church service, Miriam said. It's a long time since I saw Clara. Very well, said Paul surprised and unconsciously angry. On the Sunday afternoon, Paul met Clara at Keston Station. Clara followed Paul into the house. Mrs. Morell rose. The younger woman was very nervous. I hope you don't mind my coming, she said hesitatingly. I was pleased when Paul said he would bring you, replied Mrs. Morell. Looking at Paul, she thought what a man he looked in his dark, well-made clothes. Her heart glowed. She and Clara started talking about Nottingham. Clara still rather nervous, Mrs. Morell still rather proud. But they were getting on well together, Paul saw. Mrs. Morell measured herself against the younger woman and found herself easily the stronger. Clara was very respectful. She knew how highly Paul thought of his mother, and she had been fearful of this meeting, expecting someone hard and cold. She was surprised to find this little, interested woman chatting so easily with her. At tea, the atmosphere was cool and clear, where everyone was themselves and in tune with the others. Afterwards, Paul cleared the table, then walked into the garden, leaving the two women to talk. Clara offered to help wash the dishes and was allowed to dry the tea things. It was painful for her not to be able to follow him into the garden, but at last she allowed herself to go. She went to Paul, who was watching the bees among the autumn flowers. At that moment, Miriam was entering through the garden gate. She saw Clara go up to Paul, saw him turn, and saw them move together. Something in the relationship told her that they were already a couple. 
they were looking into each other's eyes, laughing. At that moment, they became conscious of Miriam, and everything changed. Miriam shook hands with Clara, saying, It seems strange to see you here. Yes, replied the other. It seems strange to be here. There was a pause. It is pretty, isn't it? said Miriam. I like it very much, said Clara. Then Miriam realised that Clara was accepted here as she could never be. She asked Paul for a book to read. He ran indoors to find one. When he returned, Clara turned to go indoors, leaving him to walk with Miriam to the gate. When will you come to Willy Farm? Miriam called to her. I couldn't say, replied Clara. Mother asked me to say she'd be pleased to see you any time. Thank you, but I can't say when. Oh, very well, said Miriam with some bitterness, and left. That evening, the lovers went out over the fields. Clara leaned against him as they walked, and he held her closer and closer. Suddenly Paul's blood flamed up in him. He caught her in his arms and kissed her again and again. But she was worried about catching her train. They had only 14 minutes to get to the station, so they ran madly through the darkness. Away to the right, they could see the lit-up train approaching. At last, Clara fell into the train, completely out of breath. The whistle blew. She was gone. Before he knew where he was, he found himself back home in the kitchen. Do you like her? He asked his mother, rather unwillingly. Yes, I like her. But you'll get tired of her, my son. You know you will. You better take some hot milk. He refused and went to bed, feeling confused and angry. 